Welcome, welcome, welcome. We start a new series this weekend. I am especially looking forward to starting this series because this one is going to be extremely, extremely practical. Um, we're all involved in relationships. I remember saying this just a few weeks ago. Um, the one area of our life that probably causes us the most grief, aside from money and finances, are going to be relationships because, you know, people are different. I don't know. Did you realize people are different? Yeah. Turn to somebody say, everybody's different. And so when our differences clash, if we're not, if we're not trained to how to navigate through the difficulties in a relationship, it can cause hardship, it can cause grief, it can cause division. Sometimes we lose people that we're really fond of because we haven't learned how to navigate through some of the challenges. And this is a real thing. You know, God is very concerned about these types of things, especially within the church. He wants his children to be able to get along together. Amen? All right. So there's no doubt that inside of every person, a Christian or not, there is a desire to become a better, a better you. Um, secular society calls it self-improvement. Um, I don't think that's working too good. We call it, the Bible calls it spiritual growth. Because, you see, we're supposed to mature. We're, we're supposed to mature. <laughs> we're not supposed to be going backwards. We're not, supposed, we're not supposed to be becoming immature as believers. We're supposed to mature. We're supposed to be growing spiritually. And one of the greatest marks of spiritual growth is when a person learns how to walk in love, especially with somebody that you don't agree with. Amen? And we can do that. We have that power. We have that ability. So the Bible asserts a bold idea that Christians who believe, those who believe, and know and follow Jesus Christ have something deeper going on on the inside. There's, there's a working. There's a process. There is the, the power of the Holy Spirit. And we talk about the Holy Spirit, and everybody, you know, always puts the emphasis on the spectacular, the, the, uh, the outward appearances of the Holy Spirit. But the greatest work of the Holy Spirit Jesus taught us was he introduced the Holy Spirit as a teacher. And so the Holy Spirit that's inside of us, who resides in every believer, is actively wanting to teach us. He's wanting to take us from glory to glory. He's wanting to walk us through the valleys. He's wanting to show us how to get back on the mountaintops. And so it's a very practical teaching that I'm going to be bringing to you for these next few weeks. Amen? Uh, Christianity, at its truest form, is not really about getting better, a better, becoming a better person. Jesus didn't come here to make people better. Jesus came here to get dead people and make them alive. Amen? But there is a process that we need to allow the Holy Spirit to work through us and on the inside. And that process is really the process of dying to our old self and seeing the, the life of Christ get formed in us. It's, it's a spiritual thing. It's a supernatural thing. And how God accomplishes this, or, or better yet, the better question might be, what tools does God use to do this? Well, number one, the obvious one, is the Word of God. It's, it's your Bible. It's, it's the Word that God has preserved for us for all these thousands of years. That is the main agent of, agent of change in our lives. You will notice that if you go into a season where you start spending more time studying the Bible, reading the Bible, letting the Word of God get inside you, you start realizing there's change that's taking place on the inside. Romans chapter 12, verse 2, a very familiar portion of Scripture for us. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is a good and acceptable and perfect will of God. In other words, the more of the Word of God that we allow to become um, our belief system, not just on the weekends. Are you listening? Not just on the weekends, but all week long. Not just Wednesday night, but all week long. Amen? The more that we have of the Word of God that we're, that's becoming our natural default, that when something happens, we automatically go with what the Word says. And not to go, wait, wait, let me, let me, go, let me look at my little note cards that I'm carrying in my pocket. And I used to do that when I was a very young Christian, carried note cards in my pocket, like for particular scriptures, like, you know, if you're going to lose it, go to this scripture. But then there comes a time when you don't need the, the cards anymore. There comes a time when it's written on your heart and it starts to become your natural go-to. Amen? 
The second agent of change, and I don't mean this in the order of priorities, um, there's not one better than the other, is the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit uses the Word of God. And will remind you. Remember one of the things that Jesus said when he introduced the Holy Spirit? He said, he will remind you all things that I've said to you. So it's the Holy Spirit's job on the inside of us to remind us of the scriptures that we read. But, but watch this now. If you're not reading any scriptures, how is he going to remind you? He can only bring up what's already deposited on the inside. Amen? So one more tool that is used by God to bring us to a place of, 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 of consecration. And, and, and remember, this is the emphasis for 2019, is, is, is the time of consecration. And, and, and everybody's at different degrees and everybody's at different, different places in your walk with God. But it's, it's coming, it's, it's getting to, the consecration is allowing the Holy Spirit to work in us to bring us to a place where we're getting further away from our old self and closer to the image and likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? So one of the tools that God uses to bring us to a place of consecration, to bring us to a place where we're more and more reliant on him, is relationships. So how is that, how is that possible, Pastor? It seems like my relationships are making me worse, not getting better. Because when you're, in, when you're, see, when you're committed in a relationship, so we're going to talk about the subject of loyalty tonight. When you are committed in a relationship, then it will, that, that commitment forces you to treat that person, to see that person, to interact with that person against what's natural in your flesh because you have made a commitment to God Almighty. Are you listening? We'll, we'll get there. I'll explain a little bit more to you. So uh, in this series, we're going to be studying four different relationships that are recorded for us in the Word of God, in the Bible. Each one of them will reveal to us what worked, what difficulties were overcome, and what principles did the people involve themselves in or, or, or did they apply. My goal is that in these relationships, they're human relationships, but we're going to see the Lord Jesus Christ in his character and his nature through these. And so, I mean, that's what we're called to do as believers. We're supposed to let our light so shine before men that it will glorify our Father in heaven. So this first part, part one, we're going to talk about the relationship between a mother-in-law and a daughter-in-law. This woman's name is, the daughter-in-law's name is Ruth. The, mother, the mother-in-law's name is Naomi. She has, Ruth has her own little book named after her. It's in the Old Testament. It's tucked away over there. It's only a few chapters. But we're going to look this weekend at the example that was set and how these two individuals conducted themselves. Ruth, chapter 1, verse 1. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to dwell in the country of Moab. He and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech. The name of his wife was Naomi. The names of his two sons were Melon and Chilion. They were Ephratites of Bethlehem. In other words, they lived in the region of Bethlehem in Judah. And they went to the country of Moab and remained there. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. Now they took wives of the woman of Moab. The name of one was Orpah, and the name of the other was Ruth. And they dwelt there about 10 years. Then both Melon and Chilion also died, so the woman survived her two sons and her husband. All right, so let's, let's, let's focus in here. What do, we, what, do we, what's, what do we have going on here in this story so far? Well, because of the famine, this husband decided he's going to take his wife, take his two sons, leave their home country, leave their families, leave their everything that was natural to them, everything that was familiar to them, leave their people, and go to a place that was not considered God's territory or the land that God had given to his people. This land of Moab is in modern-day Jordan, southern Jordan, now, Elimelech is just looking out for his family's welfare. He moved them from Bethlehem. Interesting enough, he moved them from Bethlehem, Bethlehem meaning the house of bread. 
He, he left the house of bread because there was no bread and went to a foreign land so they could survive. They settled in that land. He brings it to a place in order for them to experience a better life than what they had there. And things went well for a little while. And then suddenly he dies, Elimelech dies, and this is a game changer for his wife and family. A short time later, both sons die. Another game changer. Now we've got, tragically, we've got Naomi who lost her husband and the two sons. She's broken, empty. Naomi decides to move back to Bethlehem in Judah. How would she survive? Her husband's gone. Her sons are gone. By this point in time, she's probably been away from Bethlehem at least a couple of decades. Life has gone on there. Who's going to care for her? Who's going to provide for her? She's in a desperate situation. Both daughter-in-laws insist on joining Naomi in Bethlehem. But Naomi refused their help and urged them to return to their parents' homes. In the end, one returns. The other vows to stick with Naomi. Again, Ruth chapter 1, verse 14. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again. And I want you to notice this here. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law. But watch this. But Ruth clung to her. Big difference. Big difference. We see it all the time in relationships. Mm, love you. But who clings to you? We're going to have these happen to us in life. There's going to be those who are going to go so far, they kiss you, they're on their way. But it's the ones that cling are the ones that become a blessing. Amen? So, verse 14, and she said, look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. Wherever you go, I will go, and wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. This is a big deal here. Us today, if we move from one state to the other, we don't change gods. We might change jobs. We might have to settle into a neighborhood where we've got to make friends again. But this was a big deal here, because you see, the, the concept that people lived by in this ancient time was gods were territorial. Okay, you've got the God of Israel. You've got the gods in Egypt. You've got the gods of the Assyrians. So you step over a boundary, a border, and all of a sudden now you're out of territory now. See, they didn't have the understanding that the entire earth belonged to the Lord. There was a time in one of the battles that Israel fought to one of, with one of their enemies, and, and Israel just, just tranced all over them. And the, other, and the other army that was defeated said, well, you know what? It was because we fought them in the mountains. Let's fight them on the plains and see what happens. And they realized that God was the God, not only of the mountains, but God was God also of the plains. But you see, this mindset here is that, you know, okay, you left your land, you left the God of Israel, you went to Moab now, it wouldn't be popular to worship the God of Israel in the land of Moab. So Elimelech kind of set not such a great precedent in the life as a family. He was willing to leave his God and go to a foreign land. And then we see that his sons take wives who are used to worshiping these pagan gods, these idols. And the mercy of God is that when they come back to Bethlehem, God does not abandon them because they weren't loyal to him. God stays loyal continuously. Amen? And so, wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. This is Ruth to her mother-in-law, Naomi. Your people shall be my people and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. Do you hear this language? You talk about loyalty. This woman doesn't know if she's going to be accepted. Ruth doesn't know if she's going to be accepted in this new land. Ruth doesn't know she has no more idea of how she's going to survive. At least her mother-in-law has some family there. At least when she gets back there, there's got to be somebody that's got to have some charity. But this is a pagan woman. This is a Gentile woman. 
This is a woman who has no connection other than her mother-in-law. It's a game changer. Suddenly life doesn't look so hopeless when they get to Bethlehem. Her daughter-in-law Ruth came to her. And since she had lost her husband, keep in mind that Ruth is a Moabite woman. She's now moving to Judah as a foreigner. But she has committed to Naomi as a daughter-in-law. And she wanted to follow the God of Israel. She must have seen something on her mother-in-law's life. She must have seen something or heard something from her husband that made her want to leave her family. She could have very easily went back to her household. She could have easily went back to her parents, but she made a decision in her heart. No matter how difficult it is, I'm going to stick with her. I'm going to show loyalty. Maybe she was thinking, I'm going to honor my husband's memory by caring for his mother. Maybe she thought, my God doesn't seem like he's working too good. See, the God of Moab, the God of Moab is a, is a God they called Chemosh. Chemosh in their language means angry. Who wants, to, who, <laughs> who wants to worship a God that's angry? So she, she leaves with her mother-in-law. She comes to Bethlehem. And thank God that Ruth, took this stance of demonstrating her love for Naomi by her loyalty. And listen, at some point in every relationship, we're going to have the opportunity. Listen, listen, listen. We're, in every relationship, we're going to have the opportunity to demonstrate loyalty or not. Or not. Now, now listen, loyalty cannot become bondage. Loyalty cannot become slavery. Loyalty cannot become something where I'm just tied to this. I'm never going to get out of this. No, no, no. But loyalty is a demonstration of love. And when we have permission from God, you understand when I say permission from God? Because there's sometimes that God releases you from relationships. I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about necessarily marriage. I'll go out of here and say, that's it. I'm done. I'm signing the papers tomorrow. Pastor Joe said that God releases me from this relationship. <laughs> don't, don't do that. Don't do that. But God honors relationship, excuse me, loyalty and relationships. Listen, loyalty is not a word, it's a lifestyle. There's something wrong with your character if opportunity controls your loyalty. How many, how many don't raise your hand, because the person might be in this room. Don't raise your hand. How many of you, how many of you know people that have, that have stuck with you and showed you loyalty as long as you could provide something? Don't, don't raise your hand, don't shift, don't. Don't, don't get uneasy. We've all had them. Amen. Let me ask you this question. Is your loyalty, or let me put it this way, up until this point in your life, has your loyalty been based on what somebody could do for you, and as soon as the well dries up, it's adios. You, you, you ever had anybody like that in your life? Yeah, we all have. But the truth is that God honors loyalty. Loyalty can be defined as allegiance, faithfulness, fidelity, obedience, adherence, homage, devotion, bond, steadfastness, staunchness, dependability, reliability, trustworthiness. It can be described as dedication and commitment. Now, I was shocked when I looked up all these definitions because what I saw the opposite of loyalty defined is the word treachery. That's rough. That's rough. And let's face it, we've all suffered at the hands of someone who decided to conduct themselves treacherously rather than to display loyalty. You know, this loyalty has its roots in offense. Adam and Eve had been loyal to God until what they perceived to be a better deal presented, when, it, when, it, when the better deal presented itself, or what appeared to be a better deal presented itself, then treachery took over. And treachery is always the result of whispers. God doesn't want you to eat of that tree because he knows it's going to make you just like him. And you, you may have heard me say this so many times in the past. They were such fools. 
because they fell for such a lie that was such an obvious lie. Because the truth of the matter is, they already were just like him. God had created them in his image and in his likeness. So what the enemy was promising them, they had already received. See, disloyalty is always based on this idea that I'm missing something. So I will leave this relationship and pursue one that fulfills my interests. It always, disloyalty always puts self first. Always. Always. It's always selfish. Adam and Eve's sin was a game changer. In, in, in an instant, in an instant, when they made that decision to turn away from God, in an instant, everything changed. As soon as they embraced the devil's accusations against God, everything changed for them. In an instant. And that treachery against God not only cost them dearly, it is still costing mankind, even to today. Ruth, however, chose to put her own interests aside and chose to cling to her mother-in-law. She stayed loyal. She knew it wasn't going to be easy. And I believe that's why God honors loyalty, because most of the time, most of the time, the majority of times, walking in loyalty towards someone is not going to be easy. You know, David, the shepherd, spent years fleeing from his wicked father-in-law. I mean, he married into a crazy family, just dysfunctional. His father-in-law is like, oh. they've got to call people in. In fact, he was one of them. Go, go get David. Get David. Tell David to bring his harp because he's going crazy again. Tell, tell David to get his harp, and David would have to sit there and calm this guy down. Nuts. David spent years trying to save his life by running from this man. King Saul's jealousy of David's popularity drove the man to be determined to kill the very person that God used to deliver Israel from Goliath. Can you imagine that? The jealousy. Because David became popular. David, the one who wasn't supposed to succeed. David, the one who, when, when Samuel came to David's father's house to anoint the next king, they didn't even bother to call David out of the field. After Samuel went and, and, and the Lord's going, no, it's not this one, it's not that one, it's not this one, it's not, went through the whole line. And then finally, Samuel says to his father, do you have any other, any other sons? Oh, yeah, there's, there's David. Yeah, he smells, he takes care of the sheep, so we keep him out there. And David once he comes in, Samuel realizes this is the one. This is the one who's anointed to be king. Now, the funny thing is, it's, as determined as Saul was to kill David, was as determined that David was to honor God by his loyalty to the king. That says something about character. On one occasion, Saul had assembled 3,000 men to hunt David down. David and his few men were hiding in a cave. Picture this scenario here. David and his, his few guys, his few men that he assembled around him, are hiding in the back of a cave because they see Saul with 3,000 soldiers coming. It's that very cave that Saul decides he's going into the cave to relieve himself. Do I, do I have to? I don't have to explain, right? Okay. They're all the way in the back of the cave. You imagine this sight. If they would have only had phone cameras back then, right? So David sneaks up on Saul, but instead of killing him, he cuts a piece of Saul's robe off to prove that he had no intention of harming his enemy. Look at verse, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 24, verse 8. Then David went out of the cave and called out to Saul, my lord, the king. When Saul looked behind him, David bowed down and prostrated himself with his face to the ground. He said to Saul, why do you listen when men say David is bent on harming you? You see where the disloyalty comes from? This day you have seen with your own eyes how the Lord delivered you into my hands in the cave. Some urged me to kill you, but I spared you. I said I will not lay my hand on my Lord because he is the Lord's anointed. 
See, my father, look at the piece of your robe in my hand. I cut off the corner of your robe, but I did not kill you. See that there is nothing in my hand to indicate that I'm guilty of wrongdoing or rebellion. I have not wronged you, but you are hunting me down to take my life. May the Lord judge between you and me. May the Lord avenge the wrongs you have done to me, but my hand will not touch you. Wow, that's loyalty. Now, now, mind you now, maybe, maybe this is why God said, maybe this is why later on, God says, David is a man after my own heart. Why? Because David was perfect? No. Because David understood honor. He understood loyalty. He understood that it wasn't his place to reach out and strike this person because he was the Lord's anointed. Regardless, regardless, of whether, regardless of what his intentions were, loyalty is powerful in the sight of God. Listen, I want you to hear this clearly. Not because it's tied to a person. David really, David, let me put it to you this way. Saul was the recipient of loyalty, but, Saul, but, but David's loyalty was tied to his loyalty to God. David respected Saul and did not lift a hand against him not because of how he was tied to Saul, but, be how, but, but because of how David was connected to God Almighty. He knew, if I strike this man, I may get some satisfaction here, but it's going to harm my relationship between me and my God who has shown loyalty to me. God rescued him over and over again from the hand of Saul. Loyalty is powerful. David was loyal to Saul because David was loyal to God. Now listen, God has established the very essence of loyalty through his covenant relationship with his people. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 9, Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God, who maintains covenant loyalty with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. God's loyal to us. He's committed to us. Why do we find it so difficult sometimes to show? I, I granted we can't show the same loyalty that God does, but why is it so difficult for us? Why why are we so easy to drop relationships? Why are we so easy to just long as as long as it ceases fulfilling something for ourselves, as long as it ceases providing something, that does not honor God. That doesn't honor God. Listen, God doesn't put people in our relationships in relationship with us just because it's going to be easy. In fact, I don't know about you, but in all my years, I found that most of the relationships that God's put in my life, they're not easy. They're difficult. They require love. They require a lot of forgiveness. I know you probably haven't had this experience, but I have. It requires a lot of love, a lot of patience, a lot of forgetting, a lot of of forgiving. Am I the only one here? Okay. God says, he is the faithful God who maintains covenant loyalty. You know, this, this topic keeps coming back around again, and I'm going to have to work it into the schedule here to teach on, on covenant soon. I've been, this has been coming up in almost every service for the past number of weeks now. You know, you will hear something in biblical language when a covenant is made. When a covenant is made, both parties will say of the sacrifice that was made. See, you can't have a covenant without a sacrifice. If you go back and read Genesis 15, you'll see that God cut covenant. Cut, it's, it's always in this language, cut covenant. God called Abram and said, Abram, come here, we're going to cut covenant together. And they take animals, all different types of animals, and cut them in half and split them down the middle, and they're laid out. And both covenant parties walk in between what's called the walls of blood and point to these animals that have been slaughtered and cut in half and say this, may God do to me like this if I should ever break covenant with you. And the other person says, and God should do to me like this and more if I should ever break covenant with you. Covenant is serious. 
And that scripture we just read in Deuteronomy 7 says that God maintains covenant lo- loyalty with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. God honored Ruth's loyalty. Okay, if we read the rest of the story, and I, and I hope you will, I hope you will, because this is an awesome, awesome, this would make a great movie if they did it right. Because see, Ruth goes back to Bethlehem with her mother-in-law, and it's not easy, it's tough. They're, they're going to starve to death if something doesn't happen. And so it tells us that this is what ended up happening. She just returns to Bethlehem with Naomi, and through a series of events, which you can read if you read that book of Ruth, Ruth ends up marrying the wealthiest, most honored man in Bethlehem who took notice of her, watch this, because of one characteristic, how she treated her mother-in-law. Ruth chapter 2, verse 10. She's met her future husband. They've established a relationship. He's made known to her that he intends to marry her. And look what, she, look what her response is in verse 10. So she fell on her face and bowed down to the ground and said to him, why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? And Boaz, her husband, to be, answered and said to her, it has been fully reported to me all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband and how you have left your father, your mother, and the land of your birth and have come to a people whom you did not know before. The Lord repay your work and a full reward be given to you by the Lord God of Israel under whose wings you have come for refuge. She ends up marrying Mr. GQ. And wealthy, wealthy. Why? I mean, I mean, you're, you're, you're this guy in town. You can marry anybody. But he saw the character that she demonstrated. He saw the loyalty. She, he saw how she was willing to put herself aside for this other person's benefit. Loyalty is the very essence of a God-honoring relationship. The very idea of covenant embodies this very concept of loyalty. What does loyalty say? I promise to remain faithful even if it costs my life. And in the case of Jesus, it did. It cost him his life to stay loyal to us. Because Jesus remained loyal to the will of God, because Jesus refused to abandon the very people who would reject him, God's people are assured of a never-ending love from which no believer can be separated. Loyalty is the game changer that brought us salvation. Without loyalty of the Lord Jesus Christ towards us, there would be no salvation. Romans chapter 8, I want, I want to finish with this. Romans chapter 8, verse 35. Who could ever separate us from the endless love of God's anointed one? Absolutely no one. But there is nothing in the universe that has power to diminish his love towards us. Troubles, pressures, problems are unable to come between us and heaven's love. What about persecutions, deprivations, dangers, and death threats? No, they are all impotent to hinder the omnipotent love. And even though it is written, all day long we face death threats for your sake. We are considered to be nothing more than sheep to be slaughtered. I I love verse 37 from here on. Yet even in the midst of all these things, we triumph over all of them. For God has made us to be more than conquerors and has demonstrated love is our glorious victory over everything. So now I live with the confidence that there is nothing in the universe with the power to separate us from God's love. Why? Because he's loyal to us. I'm convinced that his love will triumph over death, life's trouble, fallen angels, and dark rulers in the heavens. There is nothing in our present or future circumstance that can weaken his love. There is no power above us or, or beneath us, no power that can ever be found in the universe that can distance us from God's passionate love, which is lavished upon us to our Lord Jesus, the anointed one. Church, when you and I deserved punishment and deserved to go to hell, Jesus remained loyal to God's plan. He would go to the cross because regardless of our conduct and our behavior, Jesus would keep his part of the deal. He died on your behalf, and because of that, you and I will never fear. We never need to fear being separated. Never need to fear of being cast out, cast away from his love, from his presence because of that loyalty. 
Jesus, listen, I want you to hear this. I want you, if you don't remember anything, I want you to remember this. Jesus is the glue that joined us to God Almighty. Loyalty. It's a game changer. When we choose loyalty in our relationships, it brings all the power in the presence of God into play on our side. Church, let's choose loyalty above all else. Let's not be so quick to cut someone off, to forget about someone. Let's not be so quick to cut people off when they cease being able to provide the things that we want. Let's remember that we honor God when we honor those relationships. I believe it makes us appealing. It causes people to be attracted to us, not for our sake, but for the sake of the one who lives on the inside of us. And you know, I think the biggest tragedy that happens in the life of a believer is when we forget these principles, when we forget that we have God Almighty living on the inside of us by his spirit. And, and we choose for whatever reason in our emotions to act out of our unregenerate side, to act out of our flesh, to act out of... And then the worst thing that happens is someone who is not yet in relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ sees that and thinks to themselves, they're no better than me. They're no better than us. What, why should I receive this Jesus if they act the same way that we do? Loyalty brings maturity and spiritual growth because it forces us to abide by a code of honor that does not come natural to us. It requires dying to ourselves and yielding to God. I want to pray. Just join me in your hearts, please. Father, open our eyes to fully grasp the depth of your love. May the reality of your love, your loyalty towards us, speak loudly to our hearts, Father. May the realization of how much you have endured from us, yet still remain loyal, let the reality of that, Father, draw our hearts even closer to you and our desire to be more and more like you. Father, some of us, respond in relationships this way because it's the only conduct we've ever seen. We grew up in families, possibly that never never held on to one another, never displayed loyalty. So, Father, it's not natural to us. But, Lord, the Word says we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And so, Lord, for those of us that it doesn't come natural, for those of us that have endured such harm and treachery, from others, Lord. Help us never to abandon the principles of your word. Help us, Father, to develop loyalty that it might be said about us that we were man or woman after your own heart. We bless you. We thank you in advance for the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, in our souls. We trust you to bring this to pass in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you for watching today. We pray this message has impacted and blessed you. New Beginnings Church exists to lead people into a life-changing, spirit-empowered relationship with Jesus Christ. If you'd like to support the vision here at New Beginnings, just head over to our Give page. Thank you again for joining us. We hope to see you soon.